Well, hello, Internets, and welcome back to the channel. Today, we are reviewing my own personal vehicle, my beloved little R56 Mini Cooper Non-Turbo Base Edition. Now, I know you all are thinking, before anybody comments all over the channel, why would a car enthusiast get the Base Edition without the turbo? Well, there's a reason for that. It was free. Yes, this was free. Now, she has been an accident. A little bit of dentage here. I've replaced this, and I had to put a door on it and you know it's only got 70,000 miles on it when I got it but the time and chain need replaced it needs the bushings in the front end replaced so uh, it was in need of a little TLC and really it's a rescue because I saved it from going to the junkyard so anyway I brought it home gave it a place to live and have been working on it ever since so we kind of have a love-hate relationship I love driving the car it is so much fun to drive uh, it's literally like having a street legal go-kart. It, it just rails around the corners. You hardly have to even slow down for them. It gets amazing fuel economy with the non-turbo version especially, but I am always fixing it. So what I make up for in saving gas from driving my truck, I put it into parts to fix it all the time. So there's a list of things that tend to go wrong with this particular generation. This is the second generation Mini Cooper, the R56. The R56 is the hatchback. Uh, they have a bunch of R numbers and it relates to the convertible, the Clubman and all the other ones, but the R56 is the hatchback. Um, this being the second generation, it has a uh, 1.9 liter non-turbo four cylinder. The Cooper S is the same engine, but it adds the turbo and significantly more power. Um, when, when BMW bought Mini Cooper from uh, Rover Group, I think in the early 2000s, uh, many BMW did not have a front wheel drive engine. So they had to source engines for these cars until they designed their own. This generation, this is a Peugeot engine, which might explain why there's so many issues with it. One of the big issues, timing chain. 74,000 miles on this, the timing chain was so bad it barely ran. And if it breaks, it ruins the engine. So you gotta get it fixed. And of course, it's not easy to get into. There's not a lot of space right here. You gotta take the engine mounts off and raise the engine up a little bit, take the wheel, the wheel well out. And it's, it's a bit of a job, um, but it is doable. Uh, I installed the timing chain myself, which was a bit of a learning experience. And while I had the engine apart, I went ahead and put a new head gasket on it. And I went ahead and did the oil pump chain and a whole bunch of other stuff to it. So that was the first thing I had to do to get it running well. Uh, the next big issue that these tend to have are the bushings in the suspension tend to wear out. Uh, the front end and mine, the lower control arm rear bushings are shot and the front uh, anti-sway bar bushings are shot. I've already replaced the rear sway bar bushings, so and it's not easy to fix them. You have to drop the whole subframe. So I'm about to, to do to do that project. I'm going to install the PowerFlex polyurethane bushings on it, um, so it'll make it handle a little better, and they'll last longer than the rubber ones that BMW, for some reason, thought they'd put in here to make it last 70,000 miles before it wears out. So it's a good thing. It's really fun to drive. <laughs> Otherwise, I might just have let it go to the junkyard. So, <clears throat> let's go over some of the things that I've done to the vehicle. Besides fixing the timing chain, um, I put an oil pump chain. I've, I ran, a, uh, the, ran over the, the gr biggest raccoon in northern Kentucky, and it went straight through. This grill popped right out, straight into my AC condenser, my radiator, my fan. So, I had to replace all of that. Um, and uh, I just posted a video on painting these Craigslist wheels that I found that were pretty scratched up. They're NKEDR9 16 inch wheels. So I've been just painted those up and installed them. Um, I'm about to post a video on the brake upgrade. I installed Zimmerman drilled rotors and uh, EBC yellow stuff pads on it. Uh, and then here pretty soon we'll be putting the Continental Extreme Contact ultra high performance all season tires on it, uh, which will make it stick to the road much better. The, the Craigslist, wheel, Craigslist wheels came with uh, Michelin snow tires of some sort and it's getting obviously a bit warm for snow tires so uh, time to ditch those and get the get the high performance all seasons. Uh, I've also done a muffler delete so the Mini Cooper it has a resonator about the middle length of the body and a couple of small cats you can just have the muffler cut off and put a pipe in there and it actually sounds pretty sporty just like that. It's not loud and cackling, it has a nice little sound. Uh, and I'm working on a 
intake silencer delete solution. Yes, the intake has a silencer and I want to hear that intake. So, uh, well, once I figure out how, how that's going to work, I'll post a video on how we're doing that. Uh, but <clears throat> this generation with the base engine, it's about 118 horsepower, so it's not a ton, but it's not a very heavy car. So you still can get yourself in trouble with it, especially since you don't have to slow down for the corners. And that's the beauty of the Mini Cooper. That's how it would win so many races against the big, you know, V8s over in England and, and their racing is uh, the V8 pass it on the straightaway, but as soon as the corner hit, that Mini would be gone. Thanks for joining and take a look at my 2009 the Mini Cooper base. so we can hear what it sounds like with the uh, intake silencer taken off and then the muffler delete on the 1.6 liter. All right, so here we go. It's pretty quiet at idle. Flex ones on. I'm considering putting a 
new anti-sway bar in to stiffen up the uh, help the anti-roll a little bit uh, if I can come up with the money. Red line is 6500 RPM and then it cuts off. It doesn't bang off the rev limiter. Uh, I try to avoid hitting the red, red line in this because I'm a little concerned with the longevity of this engine. It is possible to fit a uh, Honda K12 engine in here with a lot of engineering. I'm not sure if I'm uh, experienced enough to build all those parts for myself. But I would love to put a K12 in here that would solve the reliability issues and then it would just be, you know, a fun car and it would just could be a daily driver. I wouldn't recommend buying one of these for your daily driver because of the reliability issues. Uh, I have my truck as a backup, and of course we got the family minivan. Um, you know, you can fit two small kids in the back of this car, and that's about it. I would not want to sit back there as an adult for more than five miles. <laughs> my kids even complain about the seats not having leg room unless we push the seats all the way up. So the Mini Cooper has a very unique interior design with your tachometer in front of your steering wheel and your speedometer in the center console which is also part of your radio and the rest of your dash. It also has this weird round key that you push in and then a push button start and then all your controls are in the center including your door lock and your windows and heating controls. So it's very different and the Bluetooth connection on this older version is rather complicated to try to figure out. It does have a CD player mine, and then the, the control for the volume and turn the radio on is below, and then above is the controls to make adjustments and change your stations. So it takes a little getting used to. Uh, I actually had to get the manual out to read it to figure out how to connect my Bluetooth phone to do the phone calls, but this older version does not do Bluetooth music, so I had to plug in a, a special Bluetooth adapter to the auxiliary port to make that happen but very unique and quirky design on the interior. So this Mini Cooper has eight speakers. There are two in the door, two tweeters in the pillars, and two six by nines in the rear, so far as I could tell, and they all need replaced because they are not sounding great. Uh, they also have this really cool little hidden secret glove compartment above your main glove compartment, which I like. So the question is, should you buy a second generation Mini Cooper? Well, if you're a car fanatic and you love to drive fast and have fun, and you're willing to work on a vehicle or you enjoy working on a vehicle, then sure, knock yourself out. Absolutely so much fun to drive. I've never driven anything that feels quite like a go-kart on the road. However, if you're looking for a daily driver and you don't know how to fix things or don't want to fix things, maybe look for a third generation Mini Cooper or a different vehicle altogether. I love mine until it breaks. And sometimes it's fun to fix and sometimes it's not. That's my two cents. We'll see you guys next time.